identify them as such. Otherwise, we'll open the mics and everything. So be thinking that way as we listen to the, the final presentation. Thanks. Natalie. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. So let me. Uh, I have a pleasure to, the uh, pleasure to introduce Michael Gregory, who is a clinical professor of law at Harvard Law School, where he teaches and practices law as part of the Trauma and Learning Policy Initiative, or TLPI. TLPI is a partnership between Harvard Law School and the Massachusetts Advocates for Children, which is a nonprofit child advocacy organization in Boston. TLPI's mission is to ensure that children traumatized by exposure to violence can succeed in schools. At the Harvard Law School, Mr. Gregory co-teaches the um, co-teaches the Education Law Clinic. Which I'm sorry, at the Harvard Law School, Mr. Gregory co-teaches the Education Law at the Education Law Clinic, which has two components: law students in the individual advocacy component, which represents families of traumatized children in the special education system; students in the legislative lawyering component learn and practice the skills of lobbying and policy advocacy to advance TLPIs public policy agenda for trauma-sensitive schools. With his colleagues at TLPI, Mr. Gregory is co-author of the project's two landmark publications, which you can download on the website for free. I'll tell you how. Helping Traumatized Children Learn, Volumes 1 and 2. And he also writes in the field of special education law. Mr. Gregory has also taught courses in education law and policy and education reform movements. Mr. Gregory received his JD from Harvard Law School in 2004 Graduating cum laude, he, oops, sorry, he graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts in American Civilization from Brown University in 1998 and received a Master of Arts in Teaching also from Brown University in 1999. Mr. Gregory began his law career as a Skaden Fellow. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Gregory up on stage. Thank you, Carlo. Um, and let me start, of course, by thanking Penn State for having me here, um, but also thanking all of you for sticking around. Um, I have the daunting task of having a conversation with you precisely at that moment of the day when your attention spans have been stretched to the max, um, and also have the daunting task of having about a dozen tough acts to follow coming at the end of two days. So um, I'll, I'll do my best here. So I want to elaborate just a little bit more on uh, the great introduction that Carlo gave and, and tell you about who I am and the work that I and my colleagues do. So as he told you, um, our project, the Trauma and Learning Policy Initiative, is a collaboration between two organizations, um, Harvard Law School, which I'm sure you've heard of, and uh, Massachusetts Advocates for Children, which is um, a nonprofit advocacy organization in Boston that has a very rich history of doing very cutting edge advocacy work on behalf of the most vulnerable kids. So MAC um, is the organization that advocated for the first statewide special education laws in the country. And it was Massachusetts laws that became the template uh, for the federal IDEA. Um, it's where Marion Wright Edelman, you know, sort of got her start before she started the Children's Defense Fund. Um, MAC advocated for some of the first um, state school breakfast laws in the country before there was federal funding for school breakfast, and also um, the first lead paint laws in the country, you know, that recognize that kids that um, are exposed to lead in paint can have all kinds of um, you know, toxicity and bad outcomes. So it's an organization with a long history of being on the cutting edge. And it was back in the early 90s that MAC identified through its advocacy work on behalf of families in both the special education and school discipline systems, the recurring pattern that so many of the kids who were being excluded from schools or placed in overly restrictive special education placements um, were kids who had this common experience of, of, of trauma. And fortunately, being in Boston, um, where people like Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who was, I think, quoted on one of Bradley's slides earlier, but really the, the father, in many ways, of the modern um, understanding of trauma and the, and the um, trauma-informed movement was in Boston. Uh, many of the leading researchers uh, on the issue of trauma were there. Um, and so there was this coming together um, from the advocates, from those in the medical profession and the um, psychological profession, to really begin looking for the first time at what some of these impacts are and how trauma is manifesting itself for our kids in school. 
And so growing out of that work from the early 90s, this project um, was created and our mission is to ensure that children who have been traumatized by exposure to violence and other adverse childhood experiences succeed in school. And we work to achieve that mission in three ways. Um, the first is that um, the lawyers on the project, and there are three of us, and our law students in the legal clinic at Harvard Law School represent families, low-income families, um, who have children that have endured some form of traumatic experience in the special education system. And what we're looking at in our cases and trying to help the schools where our clients' children attend understand is the interface and the interaction between the traumatic experiences that these kids have had and the disabilities that qualified them for special education services under state and federal law. Um, and you know, more and more, um, as time goes on, schools are familiar with that interface. But when we first began this work, and we were bringing the issue of trauma to the table, um, it was something that, I mean, people looked at us like we had two heads. I mean, people just had not encountered these issues before. Um, and so fortunately now, um, it, it's, it's a more familiar issue. In addition to our work directly with families, the non-lawyers on our project, and we have um, two social workers and a former school psychologist, work directly in schools with educators in much the same way that, that Carlo and uh, Brian are working together, providing professional development and consultation support to help educators create trauma-sensitive schools. And I'll, of course, tell you more about what we mean by trauma-sensitive schools. But then what we do is taking the voices of the families that we represent, again, these are families of the most vulnerable kids, and the educators who we work with in the schools, uh, we bring both sets of voices up to the policy level and make sure that, or try to make sure, that our uh, state level policymakers in Massachusetts are providing the uh, resources and supports and the structures um, that will enable schools to become environments where all children can learn. And you know, um, being a lawyer, being in the advocacy community, we often tend to assume that there's this inherent adversarial relationship between what parents want for their kids and what schools want. And of course, um, and those we talked about, I think Susan talked about maybe the power battles that exist between systems. Well, of course, there can be lots of power battles within systems, and I think we sometimes tend to assume that um, uh, particularly in special ed, that this adversarial posture exists. But of course, when you work on both sides of the aisle, when you're working with families and also working with educators, what you learn is that they, everybody wants the same thing for kids, of course, and that that can be obscured in the policymaking process. But we feel that our job as advocates is to focus on where um, these uh, passions and priorities overlap and make sure that legislators are paying attention to that. Um, so that's where we positioned ourselves. And these are the, the three types of work that we do. Um, Carlo mentioned our two books, Helping Traumatized Children Learn, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And everything that I'm going to talk about, um, you can read more about in these two books. And this is the website where you can download the PDFs for free. Um, what I will say is that at this point, so the purple book, as it's come to be known, uh, was published in 2005, and then the Teal book was published in 2013. And at this point in time, including both um, purchases of the books, hard copies, but also downloads of the PDF on the website, um, we're now, I think, approaching about 150,000 copies in print. And that's not including educators who have printed out the PDF and then Xeroxed, you know, 30 <laughs> copies for the grade six team or something like that. So um, that's just heartening to me because I think it's, it's one barometer of how much this information is getting out there and um, how the field is changing. And we're starting to recognize um, the importance of this issue of trauma in ways that, you know, 15 years ago when we started, um, you know, we sometimes felt like a tree falling in the forest that nobody's listening to. But people are listening and that's good. So what I wanna try to do is sort of pick up the baton from all of the just phenomenal presentations that we've had over the past two days. And as I've been sitting and listening, I've identified a couple of recurring questions or themes that seem to have come up. Um, and it's my hope that, um, that our project has a, a few ideas to contribute that can maybe um, take the next step in the conversation that we've been having up to this point. 
So again, I think it was Susan that talked about moving from programs and services and frameworks um, to processes and packaging. Now, I'm not, I'm not actually quite sure what packaging is, but I'm all over process. I'm all about process. And so what we're going to talk about, or what I'm gonna share with you, is the process that we have developed collaboratively with educators for how to move forward in creating a trauma-sensitive school. So not just, um, I think Bradley gave us with a, left us with a wonderful map of all the different interventions and programs and options that are out there for schools that wanna move in this direction. But I think maybe one of the questions that is still on the table is, given all of those wonderful options, how as a school do you start to make decisions about how to move forward? Um, and so that's what I wanna talk a bit about. And then also this other idea about focusing like a laser on the adults. I mean, so much of the interventions that we've talked about are about things we're gonna do to or for kids. And th that's all really important stuff because our kids need a lot from us. But what about the adults? And so I think the, the two conversations that we've just had about um, both training educators but also providing supports to um, educators who are experiencing secondary trauma are a really great um, segue to, to this aspect of what I want to address. Um, the, the process that I'm going to talk about is all about creating a culture first for the adults who are working in the school. Um, because those are the folks who are then going to create the culture that our kids are in and that our kids are learning from. Um, and so uh, finally, I think I've already said this, but what's a theory of action for moving forward? Both at the school and district level, but then also ultimately um, at the policy level, as a state. Um, how do we decide what the best way is to move forward? So there are five core ideas that we've attempted to articulate in our two books. And, um, I'm going to skim very, very quickly over the first couple because they're things that you've already heard about um, multiple times over the past two days. So the first of these ideas is just that trauma is prevalent. Many, many students have had traumatic experiences and we've heard what some of the statistics are about that. Um, the second idea, of course, is that trauma from these experiences can impact learning, behavior, and relationships at school. And um, I, I wanna pause here just to add one little nuance um, to the way that we think about a definition of trauma. So we've heard a couple or a few different definitions of trauma over the course of the past two days. What we've learned as lawyers from the clinicians with whom we've worked is that it can be very important to distinguish between the traumatic events that students have experienced and then the response that they may go on to develop as a result of those experiences. So we prefer not to think about the event itself as the trauma. Rather, trauma is the response to the event. And the reason that I think it's important to make that distinction is because different kids can have the same experiences, but go on to develop very different responses. And so the last thing that we would wanna do is label kids with a very, what can be a very stigmatizing label based solely on the fact that they've had a certain life experience. I think the last thing that we wanna do is understand an experience a child has had and then make all kinds of assumptions about what's happened to their brain or you know, deficits that they, we might presume them to have. In many cases, some of those presumptions might be accurate, um, but I think, you know, for, for some kids, less so. I mean, um, what the ACE study revealed, which we haven't talked a lot about, a few people have mentioned it, but I'm assuming that folks in the room know about it. Um, you know, the adults who participated in that study that revealed, you know, huge rates of exposure to uh, traumatic experiences were people who had good health insurance. They were successful in life. I mean, they'd made it to Kaiser Permanente um, HMO in San Diego. I mean, these weren't people necessarily living in poverty. Um, so even in rooms like this, where we're educated and doing quite well in life, um, you know, many of us have had ACEs. And I don't think any of us would want to be labeled necessarily with a disability or with the, the label of trauma, um, you know, just based on an experience that we've had. So I would add that one nuance to the, our discussion about definition. But one and two together are the public policy problem that we're attempting to address in our work. The third core idea is the solution um, that we're pursuing. And that is that trauma-sensitive schools help children feel safe so they can learn. And here's where I'd like to begin to go into a little bit more detail about our work. Um, 
we saw a definition earlier from Bradley about trauma-informed schools. I'm going to offer you our definition of trauma-sensitive schools. You know, they're very similar definitions. Um, and I think the, you know, some of these picayune nuances that we might focus on in various programs or various, from various perspectives are probably less important than the spirit of the definition. Um, so I'll, I'll show you ours and you can see how it overlaps or maybe in some ways differs from what we've already heard. But we say a trauma-sensitive school is one in which all students feel safe, welcomed, and supported, and we are addressing trauma's impact on learning on a school-wide basis is at the center of its educational mission. Um, so, this is a broad definition and it, it um, warrants some deconstructing. So what we've done in our work, and I should say that all of this has emerged from our work with schools. So we didn't necessarily start by going to the literature or something um, and, and trying to see what the literature said trauma sensitivity was. We started by working with educators who were trying to figure this out. And then over a course of a number of years, working in a number of schools, sort of amalgamated what we had learned from folks who were doing this in the field. And that's where this definition came from. To break the definition down, we have identified the common attributes that we've seen over and over again in the schools where we've worked, where we would say, um, this school embodies that definition that you just saw. Well, the question that we asked was, what are the common traits, the observable things in these schools that seem to be working? Um, and we've come up with six of them. They're gonna sound very similar to the foundations that uh, Bradley listed on his slide, but you'll see there are some differences. So the first is that leadership and staff share an understanding of trauma's impact on learning and the need for a whole school approach. So um, this one's pretty self-explanatory, but I think importantly is not just recognizing the prevalence of traumatic experiences in the lives of children, but also recognizing that we've got to take this on as a whole school. It's really not at the end of the day about sorting, about using trauma as a way to screen and identify a certain subgroup of students and then sort of separating them from the rest of the school and applying an intervention. It's not to say that kids won't need some services, many will. Um, but truly being trauma sensitive means taking this on as a whole school. Secondly, the school supports all students to feel safe. We heard about safety um, from Bradley. That was one of his foundations as well. We talk about physical, social, emotional, but also academic safety. Um, and, and this one's really important and often left out. I mean, as any teacher knows, for a kid to advance in their learning, they have to feel uh, comfortable taking risks. Um, volunteering an answer, um, turning in an assignment is taking a risk. And if kids don't feel academically safe, if they feel that they're going to be judged or humiliated uh, because they don't understand, um, then they're not in a position to feel comfortable taking risks and their learning is going to be thwarted. Third, the school addresses students' needs in holistic ways, including, we've broken it down into four, uh, four domains, relationships, self-regulation, academic competence, and physical and emotional well-being. Fourth, the school explicitly connects students to the school community and provides multiple opportunities to practice skills. You know, fundamentally, I think, what trauma is about, it's about feeling alienated from your community. It's about feeling that you don't belong. It's, it's about feeling that you have no support. And so school should be about becoming a place where we reconnect kids to community. And so often, um, and, and being a, a special ed lawyer, I've been you know, uh, guilty of this many, many times in my career. We focus so much on getting the kids some service in that service grid that's gonna, we've talked about this earlier today, take them away from their school community. That's gonna take them down the hall to the counselor's office or to the speech pathologist's office and you know, give them some very badly needed services and teach them some skills. But then what do we do to help them generalize those skills back um, into the regular ed environment, into the cafeteria, to the school bus, so that they can then you know, use those skills to reconnect to the community that exists there. Um, a trauma-sensitive school pays a lot of attention not just to providing the service, but to making sure it leads back into the regular ed setting. The school embraces teamwork and staff share responsibility for all students. And um, you know, this sort of 
connects for me um, to the discussion that we've been having about empathy. I mean, I also sat and thought a lot about it like Christy did um, earlier in the day when we were discussing it. And, um, you know, there's a, a famous school psychologist, Robert Pianta, who's done a lot of work on the teacher-student relationship. And one of the things that he says is that competence we tend to think of as being an innate attribute of a person. You know, you're competent or you're incompetent. That's not the right way to think about it. Competence is a transaction between the individual and his or her context, his or her environment. So you might have a lot of innate competence, but if you're in an environment that you know, humiliates you or where you feel threatened or overwhelmed, you're not gonna be able to express or exhibit that competence. And I sort of was sitting there thinking, you know, maybe it's the same for empathy. Maybe empathy is a, a concept similar to that, where you might have a lot of innate empathic abilities, but if you're in an environment that um, emphasizes punitively responding to student behavior, or um, you know, that doesn't um, sort of privilege or incentivize your expression of that empathy, you, you might end up not looking like an empathic person. So I think teamwork um, and working in a context uh, working in a culture, a professional culture that um, shares responsibility for all students and it, it takes also responsibility for supporting each other is going to allow for that empathy to come out perhaps. Leadership and staff anticipate and adapt to the ever-changing needs of students. And one example that I have to share here is there's a, an urban district in Boston where we've done a lot of work um, that for reasons I don't totally understand ended up being a receiving district for a lot of students that immigrated from Haiti after the earthquake several years ago. And so all of a sudden had this population of students within their schools that not only had endured horrendous traumatic experiences, but also didn't speak English, came from an entirely different culture. And I mean, th this school was brilliant in the way that it just adapted. I mean, it didn't gripe um, it, you know, they just kept going and they found a way. I mean, using their empathy and their passion and their understanding of trauma, they found a way to incorporate these kids into the school community in a really beautiful way. Um, and, and I can't think of anything more trauma sensitive than that. So these are our, our six attributes of trauma sensitivity. But they still leave a lot of questions on the table. How do we get there? And this is where the theory of action comes into play. If what we want is schools that embody these six attributes or the six foundations that Bradley listed. Uh, whatever our vision is or our, or our mission for what we want to see the school be, how do we get schools there? How do we help them get there? And this is the question that, you know, when we began doing our work, we would stop the presentation here. And people thought, well, this is great, this sounds wonderful, but, you know, the question we would get over and over is, you're leaving us with this information and you're not helping us know what to do with it. Um, and so that's where we had to go back to the drawing board, and this is why there's a second book. Um, so idea number four is that, and I spoke a bit about this already, that trauma sensitivity requires a whole school effort. You know, when, uh, years ago, when, when this work about trauma-sensitive schools was first starting, I think the impulse that so many people went to um, initially was, let's put more services into schools. If we want to become trauma sensitive, this is about increasing, you know, the number of social, school social workers and school psychologists, bringing more clinicians into the school and giving kids services. I mean, this is an a, a, a empathic um, impulse, a good thing to do. But what we saw from those early efforts was, uh, first of all, that um, if you hire new people, um, one, then when their funding goes away and they leave, then you're no better off necessarily than where you started. But number two, what that does is it makes that one person become responsible for the issue of trauma. And um, then they become just as siloed from the rest of the professional culture in the school as the kids become siloed when they get you know, given their services and taken down the hall. And this is what you talked about, being organizationally um, isolated. So um, one of the very first schools that we worked in, there was a brilliant uh, principal in the school. And she was one of the first people that helped us understand um, hiring a person is not the way to go. And in the early years, we were um, arguing um, for money from our state legislature to fund experimentation with trauma-sensitive approaches. And she said, don't give them enough money that they can hire a staff person, because that's what they'll do. I mean, you know, we want to increase our staff. And it's a very rational and, you know, thing that you might want to do. 
but she warned us against that. She said this is about infusing trauma sensitivity throughout all the operations of the school. You've got to take a more structural and sort of school culture-based approach.